Before I go on into my speech proper, with the permission of Reverend Sam Adeyemi, I would like to announce that I do have a project and I'm looking for volunteers in this hall. And I hope I'll be able to get, I hope I'll be able to get many because I need a lot. Now let me tell you what the requirements are. I need people who have a first degree or an HND in any discipline. I need people who have numeracy skills. I need people who are ready and are willing to travel at short notice to any part of the country. <laughs> I can understand what you're trying to say, that you would rather it be any part of the world. <laughs> but you know, you have to start from somewhere. Yes. Am I right? Yes. Don't despise the days of little beginnings. So, you have, and charity begins at home. Yes. So you need to start in Nigeria. Yes. And those of you who pass that hurdle, of course, will begin to travel with me internationally. Yes. Shall we put it like that for now? Yes. Praise the Lord. Now, there is no salary. Volunteer. Don't forget. No salary now. No allowance. But you will be given lunch, I promise. <laughs> Listen to this. Really need to think deeply about this. The hours will be 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Yes. That's the way it has to be. Based on the sensitivity of the project and the security my person would need, as you might expect, because of the times that we are in, that we, the times that we live in right now, you are not allowed to talk about it to any third party. You must sign a confidentiality agreement. And lastly, you're not allowed to put it on your CV. No, unfortunately not. Now, if you're interested, I only want to see the able and the agile who are aged 25 to 40. Can you be upstanding, please? If you are interested, between the ages of 25 to 40, can you be upstanding? Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask one or two more questions before my assistants who are around in the room will take down your names. Is that fair? Yes. Fine. I didn't, I didn't catch that. How many are ready to go the extra mile? That's about enough for some people, right? Right? Some are ready to go the extra mile, some aren't. Those who are ready to go the extra mile, can I see a show of hands? Amongst those who are standing. Those who have their hands up, I'll tell you now the kind of people you are, okay? 
You are the go-getters. You are the achievers. <laughs> Keep your hands up now. Those who didn't put up their hands initially should not put it up. <laughs> you are the trailblazers. You are the history makers. And you are the boundary pushers. Can you clap for yourselves, please? Unfortunately, the others aren't willing to pay the price for their dreams. Unfortunately. Because to go through the exercise that we just went through, you have to be in a special class of people. People who are ready to go anywhere, as far or as wide or whatever challenge that they are to face, that they would be ready and willing to take it up. The rest, might I say, are the wishful thinkers. They're the daydreamers. They're the procrastinators. Now you may be seated in his presence. Thank you. Let us believe God that if you're not quite there yet, it's not a sin. By the time you leave here today, you would have changed your mindset because there's a lot to learn. Some might have said to you that the sky is your limit. I say foul. I say that the sky is only your stepping stone. Especially for those who had their hands up. Can you now welcome the achiever that is seated at your right? The trailblazer on your left? The pace setter behind you and the history maker that is seated in front of you. Thank you very much for taking part in that exercise. I believe that it taught us quite a bit. You all believed it, didn't you? You did, didn't you? But we saw volumes. We could read volumes out of what just happened. Not many people are ready to go that extra mile. Not many are ready to pay the price. There are churches and there are churches. I've been to many in Nigeria and other parts of the world. And when I look around me, I see that this church does not only teach excellence, but it, it has the spirit of excellence imbibed in it. And it walks the talk. <laughs> Praise God. And that's for me, it spoke volumes. I've learned a lot since the time I drove into this premises and to the point of coming to this podium. God is good. Now that we've set the stage, I'd like to speak on a topic that I've titled, Pay the Price. Pay the Price. Pay the Price. And I will use my life journey, my life story, as the case study for what we're about to learn. I was born 65 years ago to an, to an illustrious Ikorodu family here in Lagos. I am the eighth out of what was formerly 52 children, but we are now 45, to a Muslim father who had eight wives. 
my mother being the first. So I come from a polygamous family, as you know. When I was seven years old, I was sent to the United Kingdom with my junior sister, who was six years old, my half-sister. Four years later, we came back to Nigeria on the instance of my father. I wanted to study law, but my father, who was an Ijebu man, did not believe in investing too much in the female gender. So he said to me, why do you want to study law? Lawyers don't get briefs as much as they used to. Now they go from door to door, knocking on the doors and asking, Shane Jordao. Meaning, do you have a case I can take on? I need the job. I need the brief. So he said, because you're a girl and you're going to get married at some point and you're going to change your name and my name, his name, would no longer be relevant in your life, why should I invest so much in you? Okay, you can go to the United Kingdom, but study a course that won't be for four years or five years, but it'll be for one or two years, and you'll be back here and, you know, we'll get you off married and sent back into your husband's uh, home. So, as a dutiful daughter, I obeyed my father. I did precisely that. And I studied the secretarial administration. And I returned to Nigeria as a confidential secretary. And I worked in Shijuade Enterprises in 1973 as a confidential secretary. 18 months later, I moved to a new bank that had just come into town in 1974 as an executive secretary. And over time, I began to get dissatisfied. I was bored with this secretarial work. And I began to agitate for something better because I knew that within me that I could do a lot better than that. I got promoted to different parts of the bank, one of which was to set up and head the corporate affairs unit of the bank. The bank was called the First National Bank of Chicago. And it has changed hands over the years. I've forgotten the bank that uh, eventually bought it over the second or third time. I eventually left the bank after I had ended up in the banking proper sector. I'd done an in-house training program, at the end of which we had an examination. And there were 11 of us in the class. I was seated with bankers and MBA holders. But out of the 11th, 11 of us, by the time the results came, I had come out fifth in the exam, to the glory of God. That spoke volumes to me, that if only I had that opportunity to have gone to university, maybe I would have come out with a 2-1 or a 2-2, but that didn't happen. That wasn't to be my destiny. Don't get me wrong, some have misquoted me as saying that you don't need university. I've never said that. You do need university. I would have loved to go to university. We have sent our children to some of the best universities. And we all know that university education 
is good. But for some of us who have not gone, it's not the end of the world. So I give glory to God. I have to make the most of whatever else and wherever else God was leading me. I left the bank to pursue my passion in fashion in England and returned home to start my fashion business. Within three weeks of showcasing my label, I entered for a national fashion competition in 1986, and I won that competition. This job started my fashion career and propelled me into the limelight. Getting to and remaining at the top in the fashion industry was definitely not easy. It took hard work and sleepless nights, and there were times when I would be abroad and I would have to create designs for my clients and fax them to Lagos. And I had to monitor my staff remotely. While I was at it, I had an opportunity to broker a transaction for a client who wished to lift crude oil. This failed. At the back of my mind, I reasoned that I had nothing to lose if I pursued another business on the side. I began to look for contracts such as catering services for offshore crew or transportation services to move crude from one location to another. All of these were turned down by the various, for various reasons. But having put my foot in the door, I decided that I was not going back. So, what did I do? I was informed by the federal government uh, that the go federal government had a new policy to encourage and empower its nationals, Nigerians, to empower the indigenous oil companies to prospect for oil. The sector had been dominated by foreign multinationals. I decided to apply for an oil prospecting license at that point. I perceived that since the government was disposed to boost local participation in that sector, it would make the process easier for Nigerians. How wrong I was. I was very, very wrong. It took three long years, three petroleum ministers, <laughs> and three different applications before the allocation was finally made. Sometimes, I remember that sometimes it took a year to even get a response to any of my applications. And sometimes I wondered that was it because I was a woman that my applications were not being taken seriously. But guess what? I kept pushing anyway. I saw this opportunity as a challenge and I chose to face it and tackle it. I cannot tell you all that I went through because of time and that because there are other speakers. But suffice it is to say that it was during these trying times that I found Jesus. And I made a covenant with God that I would serve him all the days of my life only if he would bless me. 
Yeah. That was why not so many of you got up. Who wants to pay the price? Everybody wants the goodies. Initially, I was one of those. It was all about the blessing. And then, there were many 40-day fasts and prayer vigils. And I was going from church to church for prayers. I wanted a miracle. And I was beginning to get ready to pay the price because I could tell that this road was not going to be easy. I was ready to pay, to, to go that extra mile. This seemed to, my, to be my very, very first step in that direction. When I saw that there was nowhere else to turn. God came through for me. I was eventually awarded that license I told you about. However, the block that was allocated to us was in 5,000 feet depth of water. Yes. It was in the middle of the ocean. And when I was asked to give it a name, the first name that came to my mind was Agbami. In Yoruba language, it means deep water. Due to its location, it was very difficult to explore. And we had to shop around for new technical partners and even for mentors. Almost all our family's savings went into the process. And to the glory of God, we struck oil. But only after 15 years did we strike, did we get to first oil. It takes patience. It takes tenacity. It takes diligence. How many would be willing? Still one of those reasons why we went through that exercise. Not many would be willing. Our investments could have gone down the drain if we had hit a dry hole. They could have been the worst price anybody could have paid. And people would have said, and they did say, at some point later, that Amoli, Amoloji Kokuru, long throats, they worried them. So if you failed, they would have said, why did they go through that route? They were comfortable before, and then they lost all their money. And then they'll say, oh, they gambled it away. Because it is a gamble. I'll tell you more about that later. I have heard and I have read so many things about me. Some say she sold her way to the top. She sold her way for an oil block. And I remember that the headline of one of the national dailies in this country once said, hairdresser given an oil block. So I even became my hairdresser. hairdresser. Can you imagine? One of the many names I was given. A lot of people do not know my story. Many do not know my journey. The following Shalakija that you see standing before you today and the following Shalakija that I know is a product of 65 years of hard work, sweat, many years of prayers, tears, 
and tenacity. She did not become an overnight success, but paid the price and continues to pay that price daily. When you hear of Fanfa Oil Limited, that company took 21 years to become a full-fledged reality. A lot of our young folks today want to get rich quickly. They want to graduate from the university in 2016 and by December 2017, they want their own accommodation. They want to have had it, one that belongs to them. They want a brand new car that belongs to them. And they want that perfect, well-paying job that anyone could ever ask for. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong in that. What I'm saying is that wealth does not fall on anybody's laps and it's never that quick. It takes time, it takes hard work, it takes diligence, it takes patience, it takes tenacity. It takes determination to get from that level to that level. I want to ask everyone this afternoon, whether you're in this hall or you're watching online, what, what is your dream? And what price are you willing to pay to achieve your dream? It's a question we must always ask ourselves. What will you be willing to pay for it? For you to excel and lead in whatever your endeavor is, you must have to go the extra mile. Do the unthinkable at times. And sometimes, embark on something that's seemingly impossible. A journey that may shake your faith, that would test your ability, your stamina, that would test your intellect and your tenacity. A clear example, as I say again, I'll keep reminding you of that exercise, was that opening exercise. Let me share with you eight out of some of the principles that have guided me that I have imbibed over the years that have taken me to where I am today. Number one, wisdom. God spoke to me. He said, follow on shore, ask me for wisdom. I thought that when I did, maybe with one prayer, I would just get it just like that. I carried on asking. I was reading the book of Proverbs that talks so much about wisdom. I was praying about it, but guess what? It took a whole year before I realized and confirmations went ahead to say that, my daughter, I have now given you wisdom. Praise God. If you look up in Proverbs 4, 7, we all know what it says. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in, your, in all your getting, get understanding. When we got our license, we could have chosen to sell it at a fee and move on with our lives. 
and sip champagne in the south of France somewhere. But rather, we decided to hold on to it and see to its logical conclusion. Selling it was not an option. We stuck with that decision. So as a leader, you will have to make many tough decisions. You may have to make rough ones too, and difficult ones for that matter. Those choices have to be made by you. You need the wisdom of God to know what to do at each time. The Bible tells us that we must always ask God first. It is in your asking that the Lord will respond. It is in your asking that you will take the right route, the right road, and be at the right place at the right time. Because he's the all-seeing God. He's the all-knowing God. Some say, my friend, come, 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 come. This is business. Take God out of it. But I say, business is God's business. He owns business. Everything about business is about him. Says, those who do not work shall not eat. He's the one that provides all that you know, that you need to know, to be able to prosper and to excel. Number two, get rid of the naysayers around you. The naysayers, those who are always saying no. No, 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 no. When you are convinced of what you want to do, of course, after having taken it to the Lord in prayer, and he has spoken to you, and you know that you have put everything in its right place, you have put in the spirit of excellence that this church puts in place, at all times and in all seasons and in all things, you'll find that there are always pessimists around you. It is for you to know who those pessimists are and what could be the negative result of what they're trying to do to discourage you. In year 2000, the government of the day took 50% out of our 60% equity and they transferred it to NNPC, Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation. Without due process, though it would have been legal for the government to make a request, but he failed to do that. When he failed to make a request and do it in the right manner, specified in the contract, it had not followed due process. He refused to negotiate with us. And he refused to offer us any compensation. He refused to take any of those steps, but chose to use force. Do you think that that should continue ha happening in this day and age? Force? It doesn't work. So we decided to go to court to seek redress. However, quite a number of people advised us not to go to court. Don't go ahead with your court case. They argued that it was absolutely impossible 
to win if you take a whole government to court. It seemed like a daunting task to the eye and to the mind of those who do not believe in their God. We refused to listen to them and though it took 12 years, we eventually won the case in 2012. Can we give the Lord a clap offering for that? Because it was his doing. And it is marvelous in our sight. It wasn't by our power. It was not by our might. It was through his spirit, through his favor, through his grace that we won. Therefore, If we had listened to them, I may not have been standing before you today. I believe that very much in my spirit. As a leader, you must never allow pessimists to deter you. Optimists are always forward looking and they're always encouraging. Surround yourself with optimists. I'd like to encourage you to find time to meditate on a few Bible verses, scriptures. Luke chapter 1 verse 37. You all know it. For with God, all things are pos possible. Nothing is impossible with God. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Habakkuk 2. Three, verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries. Though it tarries. Though it tarries. Because it will surely come. If you put your mind to it. It may take a long time. You may have to go on rough roads. You may have to cry. You may have to go knocking on the doors of pastors for help, for prayers. But it will eventually come. That is what our God promises us. Wait and have faith. Our faith worked. Three, you may have to walk alone. You may have to, it's sounding familiar, isn't it? You may have to walk alone. Remember I told you that it took us three years to get our oil license. During that dark and turbulent period, we found out the hard way that there was nobody to turn to except God. Every door was shut in our faces. That is when you know that truly there are unfriendly friends. They really do exist. We have to take that journey alone. They seem to be never ending. It was one court case after another. There were years, there were days and years that were dark, that seemed cold and gloomy. I seized the opportunity to get to know God, get to respect him, get to, get to get closer to him and to honor him. And I honored him the more on a daily basis and he showed up. He truly is the one who never leaves us, who never forsakes us. 
Nobody could see or understand fully what was in my heart except that God who kept me going. As a leader, there are times when you have to take a decision that is unpopular. It may not be accepted by your followers. They may not even understand what you're trying to say or what you're trying to do. But as long as you are fully convinced about it, because you have heard from your father, you will go ahead. Even if you have to walk alone, you will always be in good company. Jesus will never leave us. Neither will he ever depart from us. In Jesus' name. Number four, you will have to make huge sacrifices. On many occasions, you'll have to make sacrifices. Show me a man or a woman that has succeeded and I will show you someone who has sacrificed either time, money, comfort, sleep, or even food to get to where they are. They fasted. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights to launch into his ministry. He also paid the ultimate price, that ultimate sacrifice, to receive the glory that was before him. Mandela spent 27 years in jail before he became the first black president of South Africa. Samuel Ajayi Crowther sacrificed many years of labor in the Anglican church before he became the first black bishop of the Anglican church in West Africa and eventually had a university named after him. It took five for oil, 15 years to reach first oil, and it took me 25 years from my initial interaction with the oil industry to get to where I am today. Can you give the Lord a clap of me? Number five, be ready to take risks. The oil license our company was allocated was under so, a sole risk scheme for indigenous companies. In other words, all risks to be taken were on, were on our shoulders and our shoulders only. It was a catch-22. If you strike oil, you may recoup your investment and make profits in the oil reserve if it is in commercial quantity. However, if you hit a dry hole, then all your investment goes up in the air. Bafuka. Goes up in smoke. So we took that risk. We invested almost all our life savings. And nobody saw us when we were doing that. Nobody cared to know. It was when they started seeing the glory that they started hearing the story. To excel as a leader, you cannot afford not to take risks. If you're a risk-averse person, you're not likely to go far. Number six, I'll soon be done. You must keep your promises. A lot of people come to God when they're in trouble or need a breakthrough and make covenants they renege on once they obtain what they wanted. When God fulfills his part, that is when they start having difficulty fulfilling theirs. You've seen that happen, haven't you? Many people enter into covenants with God and they don't fulfill it once God has come to their rescue. 
I met a bishop from Ghana last Sunday. I was attending a, a, a church service for some children. And he asked me, Madam, I'm meeting you for the first time. But there's a question I have always loved to pose to you. And this is my opportunity, so I'll ask you. What makes you love God and worship him the way you do? Despite the level and amount of blessing that he has given you. That from his experience looking around him, that when people are blessed, most of the time they forget God. I gave him a simple answer. I said, because I know where I was before I made that covenant. I know what happened after God paid his part of the covenant. And because I had made that covenant, I felt bound to honor my obligation to him. Because I'm not the type that reneges on promises, whether to man or to God, most especially. He nodded his head. He was pleased with the answer. And it was a genuine answer. I meant every word of it. Coming here and sharing my story is one of the ways that I am playing my part in addition to other things that I do. Because I had told him that I would serve him all the days of my life. As a leader, you must keep your promises. When you sign a contract or you agree to do something, you must never ever renege. You must never ignore that contract. You must never walk away. You must never cheat others. Pay the price. No matter how difficult, no matter how narrow the road may be to ply, no matter what you may have to face, you entered into a contract. You entered into a covenant. You made a promise to man and to God because God was the witness. He heard you. He saw you when you were doing what you did. You must keep your promises. Praise God. Seven, dare to dare God to deliver. God is the giver of dreams and the one who can also fulfill it. He is the one who is our ever-present help in time of need. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God said, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of... Thoughts of... Thoughts of... Hmm. Says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a hope and an expected end. That you will say confidently, like Job, I know that my Redeemer liveth. When I decided to apply for that oil block that we've been talking about all, all afternoon, I then began to desire it. And I started praying towards it. And my dream got bigger. You have to desire before you can receive. Am I right? However, despite all my challenges, I knew God could pull it off. I knew that this was, this would have to be him. This was what gave me the confidence that I needed and hope in my prayers and my fastings. And God did. He didn't disappoint me. And the rest, of course, as they say, is history. Without his assistance, 
I said again, and I say again, I would not have been here today. And I do not take the God factor lightly. No. There is always the God factor in leadership. This is because of man's finite ability and knowledge of the future. For you to be successful, you need God's super added to your natural to give you supernatural results. Number eight, the last one. Believe in yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, who's going to believe you? Believe in you. In order to succeed in life, you need to believe in God's ability within you and also believe of. When some people referred to me as an ordinary fashion designer who was given an oil block, I didn't let that deter me. I didn't let it debar me. I didn't let it deny me. I didn't let it delay me. Even though the terrain was unfamiliar and so many words and terms were new to me, I kept on learning. I asked questions. I read many materials about the oil industry. And I attended many meetings related to our project and to the oil and gas industry. And I kept on at it. As I grew in knowledge, I became more confident. Therefore, when you aspire, I beg of you, believe in you. You may have to go back to school or get mentorship. You might even have to undergo apprenticeship. Yeah, you might have to. But I encourage you, go for it. You will never know what would have happened if you didn't. And that is what will lead you to succeed. If you don't try, you can't know, you can't tell. So don't give up on yourself at any point in time. The ability of God will enable your words of faith. So speak in faith rather than in unbelief. Look at yourself in the mirror and tell yourself, say to yourself, I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. I am more than a conqueror. I am a winner. And I have God's ability. I am a success. I have all it takes to succeed in all of my endeavors. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I cannot fail because God cannot fail. And for as long as God cannot fail, and considering the fact that I'm his child, I will not fail. Amen. I thought everybody would say, I will not fail. I will not fail. Praise the Lord. Let me conclude by saying that for you to succeed in this life, to become a leader in your chosen field of endeavor, there is always a price to pay. And the best time to pay that price is now. <laughs> Children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, I will end my speech with this song by Mary, Mary. Can we have the chorus? It says, I just can't give up now. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me the road would be easy. And I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. Thank you. God bless you.